Uh, welcome everybody to our second webinar of 2022. Uh, you may recall we had a webinar on managing boats on London's busy waterways uh, back in December 20, uh, just over a year ago. And this was presented by Matthew Simmons, the National Boating Manager for Canal and River Trust. At the time, Canal and River Trust were undertaking some preliminary informal consultation on this issue prior to producing their final consultation on managing mooring space in inner London, which is now out. I'm pleased to welcome Matthew back uh, to present the details of this consultation together with Ros Daniels, London and South East Director. I also understand we'll be hearing some updates on other issues on London region's waterways. So I will now hand over to Matthew and Ros. Thank you. Thank you, Libby, and thank you everyone for welcoming us back. I'm just going to uh, share my screen and so I can go through some slides with you. Um, just bear with me. Hopefully, is that working? Hopefully people can see that now. Um, so yes, it's good to be back. It was, back, I think, back in November when we talked to you, when we were finalising details of the consultation that's now live. So we wanted to come back and just go through some of those details and give people a chance to ask questions if they want to, but also encourage people to take part in that consultation and also share a few updates on other things that are happening in London. So as well as the update on the Managing Busy London's uh, moorings consultation, we just give you a brief update on what's happening on the other side of London and the water safety zones on the Lee. And then we will be um, talking about some of the things that will be happening imminently in the uh, London area related to the London Mooring Strategy, some improvements that are happening. Um, an update on some other um, visitor moorings in Milton Keynes, uh, look back at the winter works that have just happened and finally, I just wanted to share some things around the changes to the Environment Act, which are coming into effect later this year, and obviously a chance for people to ask questions. So we're going to do this as a bit of a double act. I'm going to start off and I'll pass back to Ros, and then we'll go back and forth a little bit. Um, but to start with, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the current consultation. So I think when we talked to you back in November, we uh, said there was a range of options we'd considered and I, I just want to start off by highlighting the things that we did consider but were not in the consultation. So we did look at everything that might be possible ranging from charging for all mooring or even charging for visiting any part of the inner London waterway and looked at those options but considered that for what we're trying to achieve which is to get a balance between there's very many different types of boaters who want to enjoy London that actually those were probably too far one way. Um, and so to balance the needs of both the liverboard boaters and the visiting boaters and the leisure boaters, as well as other waterway users, we've put out a, a much more targeted range of proposals. So the key element of what we're consulting on at the moment is to introduce more pre-booked short stay visitor mooring. Now, we're looking at that in the context of all what is currently the existing short stay mooring. So that's mostly the seven day mooring sites. But we are looking at introducing the booking system. So it gives people more certainty and it helps us to manage those spaces better. And alongside introducing the charges and the booking, what we're proposing is we would also have additional towpath ranges. So those sites uh, need to be managed better. What we've learned from the, the two sites where we currently have pre-bookable chargeable short stay moorings in um, Rembrandt Gardens at Little Venice and at Paddington Basin is that actually you do need to actively manage those on a daily basis that there are sometimes issues with um, people mooring when they shouldn't or uh, not moving on. So we actually, it, the, the balance of having to pay for those means that you should have a better service because we're aiming to have a more active daily management of those sites so that is the key proposal but to help us with that we're also consulting on increasing the overstay charge for boats that do uh, exceed the stay time 
or more where they shouldn't have because they haven't booked a space. So you're probably familiar with signs you see around the network of uh, 25 pounds each extra day extended stay charge, which we do apply in, a, in some places. We do need to have daily sightings to evidence that boats are overstaying, um, but that is not actually a, a, a huge disincentive, which is what that overstay charge is intended to, to do. It's worth remembering that we have no powers to fine boats so uh, boaters so we have to rely on a charge not a fine and 25 pounds is actually quite a low price um and not a disincentive so we're looking to increase that in the same way that our waterside mooring um colleagues who manage our permanent moorings they have a increased an unauthorized um, mooring charge to 150 pounds a day and on the olympic loop we also have a similar unauthorized mooring charge of 150 pounds now we haven't said whether what that charge will be but it will be more than 25 pounds and that will be determined when we when we publish what the final proposal is after the consultations ended and we've had a chance to look at that we're also consulting on banning any double mooring of y beams on the regents canal just to ensure that there's a clear passage and navigation through and and that isn't causing any obstructions and then alongside the specific proposals about managing those short stay moorings, we're also asking some in principle views about uh, whether we might consider creating more permanent moorings online, west and east, further out. So not in the busier parts, but further out on the Grand Union in the west and possibly on the Slough Arm and then further east, further up the Lee. So we haven't got any specific sites or proposals, but we want we know that online mooring can be particularly contentious, that many boaters are not keen on that. So before we went down the avenue of, of doing lots of specific proposals, which would of course be consulted on as well, we're just testing the water to get a, a steer on people's views on that. Um, and uh, actually the last one is, is an error that shouldn't be on this bullet point because we're not actually asking for views on how we fund boat facilities. But what we will be doing later this year is we are currently reviewing facilities across the trust and how we uh, deliver a minimum standard on customer service facilities and how we make sure it's consistent everywhere. So we will be consulting probably in the autumn around details on, on that on customer service facilities. But these are the locations where we currently uh, have short stay mooring and these are the ones we are proposing to uh, make pre-bookable and chargeable visitor moorings. So you can see they're mostly in central London. We do have Cowley North on the, on the Grand Union out west and also further out east, Victoria Park and Broadway Market. Now we're proposing that those ones along with Kensal Green would probably be seasonal, so they would only be pre-bookable in the, in the period from April to November, the sort of busier part of the year, and the rest of the time they would just relax to a free visitor mooring, so you wouldn't be required to book or charge for those ones, but the inner London ones would be looking at charging and pre-bookable all year. We are as we've set out that in principle we think there'll be a range of prices so a high medium and low prices but we haven't specified what those would be at the moment so we haven't decided on that currently in Paddington Basin I think we charge 12 pounds and a little Venice um, it's 10 pounds now I think I it's I can say that we think that's too low so it'd be more than that and but what that income will enable us to do as I say is to have additional staff on the towpaths so that we can manage the towpaths, the visitor moorings more actively. But as I say, when we've finished the consultation and looked at the responses, we'll publish what those low, medium, high prices will be afterwards as part of the next steps. So as I say, the consultation is live at the moment. It runs for another month until the 28th of March. Um, we've had, well, when I looked last week, we'd had 450 responses. It's gone up a little bit. It's nearer 500 now. And we are getting a, a mixture of views from both boats with moorings and those who continuously cruise and livable boaters. So it's important that we want everyone to have a view because, as I say, the key element of this is to try and make sure that London's waterways are managed fairly and accessible to as many people who want to boat in them as well. 
it's worth highlighting that those short stay pre-booked moorings we're proposing only make up about 10% of all of the water, the mooring space in London. So it still leaves 90% where you can just turn up and moor most of that staying for up to 14 days. So we think it's a, a reasonable balance um, but it's important that people give their views. So you've got until the 28th of March. Um, I believe that Libby has circulated the, the link to the proposals in the document and the link to the consultation. So if you haven't already, I hope you will um, give your views. I'm going to pause for a moment and then I'm going to hand it over to Roz, who's going to talk a little bit about the other side of London on the River Lee and the water safety zones and what's happening over there. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, as you'll um, no doubt be aware, we've uh, trialling the water safety zones, as Matthew says, on the River Lee. <clears throat> um, next slide, please, Matthew. And um, so just to update you, this is um, increasingly a space which has got multiple users. And again, we're trying to trial different ways so that every user of, of the space uh, can sort of uh, feel safe and use the safe uh, space safely. Um, so since set January, we've been using daily sightings to apply our um, published improper mooring process on the River Lee. And so in the first six weeks, we've sighted 114 boats that we've been, I, I've been able to identify as improperly moored and this is the you know established places like under bridge holes on tight bends etc and then we've had 47 boats which we haven't been able to identify so that's where no index number is dis displayed and as um again we have a separate process again but being able to try and identify these boats so it gives a sense of scale um about the number of boats that have been uh, mooring in in these um, already identified no mooring zones. And so, as I say, of those 40 boats, uh, so sorry, of the identified boats, 40 have moved after our first sighting, plus of that first sort of notice or contact with our, um, our team of, of rangers who are out and about, and 15 moved within a week. So again, our, our process really is about continuing to work with our ranging, ranger team to get out, have conversations with people, increase people's knowledge and understanding. Particularly, we found that um, the number of boats and uh, is constantly changing the number of boaters often not come to, new to boating um, so it's about a process of working with them to educate and you know to share our knowledge of the zones and where it's safe to moor and where it, it's not so next slide please so i think it's back to me next to talk oh, about sorry. The slide. That's right. but before we ha hand back i just say um if you're interested in more detail in how the improper mooring process works and want to see the information that's been circulated and distributed widely on on the lead to voters there on our website if you put in improper mooring you will go to a web page which sets out the, the process and has links to the mooring obligation booklet and the voters handbook if you're interested in those so just um, to um jump in quickly as, as well there sorry matthew i thought i had another slide just to say that as our consultation and our engagement with um um, users of the water, River Lee continue. So our Lee Navigation Forum that currently meets monthly continues to meet and we have a cross section of all users across the River Lee. This really is about to try to provide a forum for people to come and bring their concerns, some of their suggestions. So again, we've just recently had a, a workshop around how we can all um, improve the education and knowledge of, of boaters whether that be on power craft or power craft so again we're sort of working through some of those proposals um that you know we can all play our part in contributing to a sort of a, uh, the water safety zones so thanks matthew right uh, so just to give more um so london mooring strategy included the water safety zone proposals but also includes a lot of work around improving the experience for boaters I think we did refer to this when we spoke to you before, it has taken us quite a long time to finalise details of where we can put in additional mooring capacity on hard edge surface. So that's involved both sort of structural checks on, on the walls, checking for the under the water to make sure both the profile and the dredging permits mooring so that we're not putting rings in that people can't use. But we have um, now finalised about a three quarters of a mile of additional towpath hard edge, which will have uh, mooring rings installed. 
and this should be starting from next week. We've got our contractors lined up. To, they'll be installing about 150 mooring rings onto Hard Edge on the Grand Union, Regents Canal and Limehouse Cut. Um, so in some of those locations, we've also had to consult with local groups who have an interest in wildlife. Um, so as a result of that, I'm part of the Regents Canal near um, Mile End where we're putting some of this in. We are creating some offside floating vegetation to kind of mitigate against boats then mooring against um, the edge of the waterway and the impact that could have on the wildlife. So that's a positive as well that shouldn't impact on mooring or on navigation. And on the Limehouse Cut, um, as well as putting in some additional rings, we're cutting back and clearing some of the vegetation that is currently covering some existing rings. Um, the Limehouse Cut's a little bit interesting because some of the rings we're putting in are, are places where you have quite a high um, freeboard and we know boats currently more there. It, there has been quite a lot of discussion to look at whether that is safe but we've uh, done risk assessments on that and we'll be putting some additional signage in just to advise voters of, of, the, of the risks of falls but it is where boats currently moor in other places similar to that in that area so we think the additional rings there will actually be well used and popular. On top of the mooring rings we are also dredging above Norwood top lock um, so we did some surveying there and identified that um, if we carried out quite a lot of dredging there, about half a mile, it will significantly improve the moor ability in that spot. So that's another site where boats will be able to moor. So as I say, those things are lined up to start the mooring rings in March, hopefully the dredging shortly after, although I believe um, there's been some delays on the previous project, so that will push that back a little bit, but not a huge amount. But certainly by the summer, these things should be in place and completed. Um, water um, facilities is another thing we're putting in as part of the mooring strategy. So we've got two water points that are happening imminently as well. So one of those is a new water point um, in Old Oak near the collective. Um, that's due to be installed in March and when it will come on in terms of water connection I'm afraid that part is out of our hands frustratingly but it'll, it hopefully won't be too long before the utility company connects up that tap but um, certainly by the summer we hope that water point will be in place and the other one is Old Ford Lock on um, the bottom of the Lee and that is a relocation of a water tap to stop it causing a bit of congestion in the lock there where people are, are going through stopping to fill up their tanks and, um, and blocks the lock so that will be relocated nearby where it won't cause that obstruction. And then the last one that we're currently um, working on this is at um, Steel Road. So this is actually a joint partnership bit of work, working with um, the Development Corporation, and it's actually wider than facilities. Um, and so there is a, a consultation currently live on improvements to this stretch, which will include additional boat facilities, but was also asking about some proposals for the landscaping, um, and those include, you know, improving the entranceway to the waterway with seating, signposting, some workbenches for people to actually do work on their boats, and boat facilities and additional planting. So this is live now for consultation. Not for much longer though, so if you haven't already and you're interested, you only have until the end of tomorrow to get your views in on this. So the link is here and we can share these with you after the meeting. You can also look at the, the wider master plan for the area and how this sits in and the design ideas and then giving your, your feedback through the survey. This is a pre-planning consultation, so some of this will require a formal planning consultation. So there will be an opportunity once this stage has finished when the formal plans go in for people to, to comment on that as well. And then just going to touch on another visitor mooring. So we've we focused a lot in what we've talked to you about, the pressures we're facing in inner London with mooring. 
but across the southeast region we're also seeing other areas that are experiencing high numbers of boats as well not quite as high as in London but um, increasing so Milton Keynes is one of those areas where we're seeing uh, more boaters more continuous cruiser boats so more boats moored on the towpath so um, this is a project that's been kind of going back quite a while from our previous incarnation with our Southeast Waterway Partnership Board in what was then the Southeast region before we became London and the Southeast. Um, and that was to look at where we could create some additional short stay mooring for boats to visit and cruise around the Milton Keynes area. So we've worked with the IWA in the Milton Keynes area and with British Marine and the Milton Keynes Parks Trust and developed some proposals back in 2019. Well, obviously, we know what happened next. We were planning to trial this in Easter by Easter of 2020, but of course, COVID came along and that's sort of taken um, the wind out of everything. And so it was delayed. So we've, we've picked that back up, been back in touch with the IWA branch in Milton Keynes, and we're now planning to trial these six new short stages to moorings around Milton Keynes at Wolverton, Gifford Park, Campbell Park, Woolstone, Pear Tree and Simpson. Now these will only be seasonal from April to the end of October and they will revert to 14 day moorings during the winter months. These will be pilots so that we'll be piloting them for 12 months and then we're also going to improve some of the signage of the visitor moorings and at the facility points to try and stop boats mooring on those. But overall, the intention is to try and improve the uh, visitor experience around Milton Keynes. So notices have been installed on, on site and online about these new visitor moorings that are going to be introduced. Signage should be arriving very soon and be installed by April, so before Easter, and then we'll be trialling that um, for six to 12 months. Well, obviously most of these are only a six month is short stay mooring. So we'll look at what happens with these at the end of October and then make a decision before next year uh, as where we go from here. So um, just wanted to share that with you because obviously people boat beyond London too. Um, I'm going to pass back to Ros now, and she's going to give a bit of a look back on the most recent winter works. Thank you very much, Matthew. And just before I do, I just thought I'd touch on um, the impacts of the storm as well that we had um, weekend before last. Obviously, um, we'll all know the seen the news and the pictures across the country about the impacts, but just very specifically on the waterways and the impact it had on us. So we had um, between 70 and 80 trees down across the network, and that's just our, our sort of waterways. So we've been working with our contractors ever since. Um, we are providing updates on where those trees are and the works that were required but it just shows you the scale of the impact that it just had on, on, on us alone and more importantly we also had um, some damage to our impounding station in Docklands so the impounding station is the method by which we have some high volume pumps that pump water into the docks to maintain the level on the docks the storm obviously damaged the building quite significantly, which meant we couldn't use the pumps, which when, when we had to enact our emergency plans to get the emergency pumps in. You might have seen it on our Twitter feed, some of the pictures of those massive pumps that then come in to help us do the job of what was uh, was there originally, the old... Um, so it's just some of again sort of the variety of things that we as a region have to have to deal with. Um, we're still impounding water via these um, temporary pumps, and thankfully the situation is becoming more stable, and we'll hopefully very soon be able to restore normal operations. Uh, but it's very important when you've got lots of residential boats in the marinas and other craft that's coming in uh, to quite literally have a safe harbour during during the storm. But some of the winter works that we've also managed to do. Um, next slide, please. Matthew. So Den and Deep Lock, I uh, had a great day when I visited last year to see these, these works. It was the replacement of the lock gates. Again, the huge scale of the operation um, from the lifting and the several tonnes worth of, of lock gates, but really pleased the teams worked together and were able to repair repair those and, and again just gives you um, you know ins insight to the great um, logistics of that work that happens on and the 
designs that originally took place and every lock gate is slightly different as they were all designed uniquely for the place that they they were so they our engineers have to go on site take the measurements um, and then craft and fit the lock gates to to those particular locks so next uh, next slide then we've also done um, water control works particularly here you can see at Ellsbury arm our reactive team so this is our our local team so which is able to go and respond many much more to some of these uh, smaller scale um, repairs and stoppages unlike the denim deep lock which requires our engineering colleagues to get involved here they're able to come in drop in do the repairs replace um, various bits and, and make sure that we can try and address some of the water stoppages that come and you can see some more pictures as Matthew um, flicks through so again we've got various stoppages throughout the region that are coming to a close now some of those have been hampered um, by the uh, storm damage as well particularly a stoppage up in Oxford but again all of our notifications are up to date and then just uh, to point out that we've also got our Hartford Union open days again these are a casualty of the storm they were meant to be uh, the weekend of the storm but pleased to say that we've been able to rearrange these so our Hartford Union open days are this Friday and Saturday so come come along um, book onto our tours and you can go along and walk in the bottom of the canal you know these are the stoppages to help us repair the historic walls um, which are usually below the waterline and they are um, receiving the restoration work we were able to do some last winter if, for those of you who can recall that so this is using our traditional techniques um, removing bro bro broken brickwork and masonry for instance and you know part of the heritage value of this is we really like to replace it like for like um, and our heritage colleagues um, are very keen on uh, coming and helping our colleagues sort of really uh, look after these for the long term so again do come along uh, if you can to next weekend to our open days and again the details are on our website Thank you, Ross. So the last segment for me before we're happy to take your questions, I just wanted to share with you some changes that are coming in as part of the updates to the Environment Act. So some of you may have picked up on this, but if not, I thought you might be interested. Um, you're probably aware that there's been a huge amount of interest in air quality over the recent years, um, both emissions from buildings, from vehicles, and local authorities and, and London boroughs have been tasked with uh, coming up with specific plans to, achieve, to improve air quality in the area. Well, the Environment Act has had a number of changes as well, which are bringing in some new uh, powers which local authorities will have. So currently, boats are, are sort of omitted from the powers related to managing clean air zones. Um, they they are covered, but the way that the, the emissions from boats are, are assessed is literally by holding up a grey scale card to determine whether a boat is emitting a dirty um, smoke or a clean smoke. So that is changing. So the, the Updates the Environment Act means that all moored vessels will come into the, smoke, into the scope of smoke controlled areas. Um, so it won't be a case of that quite archaic measure, it will be a case of determining whether they are um, emitting pollutants that uh, are breaching smoke control areas. So it isn't just boats, private dwellings will no longer be exempt from statutory nuisance legislation in this, these changes as well. And as we saw a little while ago, the government brought in a ban on the sale of traditional coal and wet wood so that the only solid fuels you can buy legitimately are those that are smokeless fuels and um, kiln dried wood. And, and one of the additional changes that the Act is bringing in is that there will be uh, an offence for, for, for not only just selling unauthorised fuels, but the retailers will be expected to tell their customers that they that is an offence to buy those unauthorised fuels for use in smoke control areas. And the limit on fines for selling that unauthorised fuel will be removed. So 
how this affects boats is that local authorities will be able to bring waterways into the scope of their smoke control zones. However, they will be required to consult on that. So they can't just retrospectively apply existing smoke control areas onto boats without having consulted with their local communities. So that is something we expect to see happening more often. And the government is also going to be running some consultation uh, later this year on its own limits, environmental targets. So there will be a DEFRA consultation on top of what you expect to see locally in different smoke control areas. Now, obviously, we have um, many, many different local authorities where our waterways run through in London alone. Um, there are a lot of boroughs. So we, we don't have one picture of where all these smoke control areas are so we've what has the trust been doing to help support and communicate this to voters so we've asked defra for details of where they all are and they're producing uh, they're gathering that information from the different boroughs and local authorities and we're going to get that and once we've got that we're looking to map that against our network and then we're exploring whether we may bring in something to advise voters when they are in smoke control areas now, obviously, we don't want to plaster signs all over our waterway, so it would probably be something quite discreet, a very uh, clear tile, perhaps with a symbol. So we're exploring that at the moment. These changes won't come in before May this year. And as I said, there will have to be local consultation if a borough or a local authority wants to apply their smoke control area powers to the waterways. So it won't be probably starting to have any real impact unless we have a very cold summer until next winter. So expect to see more information in, about this over the summer months as we get towards the autumn and winter of, of 2022. Um, where a boat does breach a smoke control area, obviously a local authority will not know the contact details for those boats. So as with any other request for a boater's details, we will be handling that through the trust's information request process so it'll be fully compliant with our gdpr requirements so they will have to put a formal request into us and then we will respond to that to provide them with the contact details of any boat that they're interested in we are obviously looking beyond these short-term changes and thinking about what we need to do and in london you'll have seen several of these examples already with the islington eco moorings with the charging points there with charging points now in Camden and at Brentford, and possibly we're, we're, there will be a, some consultation around a possible feasibility study for um, with Westminster Council around Paddington Basin and possible charging points there. So there's lots of schemes starting to happen. I expect we will see more of those, but the Trust as a whole will be thinking about a longer term strategy for providing charging points for shore-based power for when boats are moored up, particularly in the more urban areas, where it's where we see most conflict between um, different people living beside the waterway and on the waterway and the issue of smoke, particularly and generator noise. But that was just a brief update to let you know that, that those changes will be starting to come in from May this year. So, that really is a, a very short whistle stop tour of an update, but we're very happy to um, to take your questions. We haven't been able to follow any chat or questions that might have been posed, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then um, we can we can take questions if. So I can see the questions now. So Judy's asked, are there any more water points and else pump out points being installed in Little Venice? So we haven't got any plans particularly at the moment, but one of the things we are looking at, and we did trial some mobile facilities and as part of the wider custom service facility review that we're looking at across the country, we may look at um, bringing in some things that are more mobile. One of the challenges we place in, face in places like Little Vellis is actually, um, and we face this across London, where we've been investigating where we put in new facilities is, Ideally, you look at if we start with looking at a site or oh, this looks perfect, boats can moor there, looks like it's got a little space for it. Then you carry out the, the service searches under the ground and you find actually the nearest connection is a long way away, which makes it completely unviable as a scheme. So we're looking at whether there's things we can do, perhaps with mobile facilities as well, 
So as I say, we haven't got anything specifically in Little Venice at the moment, but that doesn't mean that we might not consider that as part of the wider customer service re facility review we're looking at, not the, the London morning strategy proposals at the moment. Um, Matt, thank you, and Matthew and, um, and Roz. Can I just say thank you to both for your presentations at this point um, and encourage, I know we've only got two questions sitting there, one of which uh, Matthew's already answered. So please bring in your questions on the Q&A, um, on the Q&A bit. I must admit, I was when on the subject of water points, I was very relieved to hear that you're going to move the one at Old Ford because um, uh, because that is a challenge. And there are one or two others where they're very near the locks, and um, and uh, therefore you've got people who are mooring up uh, to take on water and getting in the way of people who are trying to actually go down the locks. Uh, so I think that's something else that could do with um, being looked at. Uh, another question also from Judy was about her moorings in Little Venice. Um, I don't know if she's a, a permanent moorer there or what, but she said um, they've had problems with water levels and that causes problems for those who are moored and also those trying to navigate their way through. Uh, can that problem be controlled? So I don't know specifically the cause of that, but we can certainly look into that. Um, obviously, Little Venice uh, is, is, we've had a number of issues in Little Venice, most recently with, with weed as well that we've, we've had issues with. But I don't know if Ros knows any specific reasons about the water levels. It's not one that I'm familiar with, but Judy, if you want to drop us an email, we can certainly get an answer back or we'll come back through Libby and, and let you know. Yeah, thank you for that. It's not uh, not an issue that's been raised with me direct as sort of a, a problem, but just more generally, obviously, you know, one of the main tasks of, of my teams who are out on the ground every single day is the water control. So they are, they are running water through locks and managing the water levels right across the waterways every single day. So um, usually those things do filter if there's a sort of longer term problem other than just, you know, a lock paddle being left up or a, a pound being, um, you know, drained or, or, or something through uh, just um, error or, or uh, some other occasion but yeah by all means please if there's something more long term that's been happening let us let us know. I, I think there are a number of um, situations where this happens I certainly know that we've had some issues at St Pancras Cruising Club that you suddenly find that water levels are, um, are down and you have to make sure everybody's mooring ropes are all right and you have to make sure that nobody's um, back fender is disappearing underneath the, um, yeah. the, the walkway. Obviously, um, um, you know, there are lots of users out on the, on the waterways. We have our team, as I say, out and about and every, you know, obviously it just sometimes um, lots of people moving through locks and things someday, the water levels can change. So we do try and, and if there are any sort of a real emergency situations, please again, um, flag it through to our customer inquiries team and we can get a team on it um, pretty, pretty quickly even out of hours um, and that out of hours numbers for emergency numbers as well just point you in that direction to flagging those those yeah. emergency situations and we do use technology as well so we've got about 500 SCADA sensors across the whole country which help us monitor sudden changes so things that we wouldn't expect to see we can respond quickly out of hours as well if things happen so that is something we do monitor as well yeah Judy's actually come back and said we're a very large pound yeah. which of course at Little Venice they are. So once the water has gone down, it doesn't refill easily. Yes, it's a, it, it is quite a mammoth task for the for the team when they, it, it, as you rightly say. Well, we're talking of the entire Paddington Arm, aren't we? <laughs> yes. Mm. Yes. 20 odd, yeah, 20 odd. Yeah. Um, Paul, our, our um, AWA um, region chairman, has said it's not exactly a question, but more of a comment says the £25 overstay charge has not been increased, my knowledge, since 1982. What are you doing to ensure they keep up to date in future? So that's a good point. I think it's uh, like any of these things, um, you have to set it an appropriate level and, and keep reviewing that. Um, it's the same with congestion charges in London, you know, they've increased over the years. So it's something we will, I think, have to be better at monitoring and, and keeping a check on. Clearly £25 in 1982 was worth a bit more than it is now. Um, I can just about remember that. 
and uh, and 150 pounds, which is the upper level that they charge on waterside mooring for in unauthorized mooring. You know, that's we think a disincentive, but obviously that might change. So it's a good point. I think it's a, a you know it's easy to forget um not to keep an eye on these things but the whole purpose of having pre book mornings is we can monitor their usage how popular they are when they're busy when they're quieter and having more active presence on those mornings with more towpath rangers checking them and managing them so it'll be part, part of a whole sort of more proactive approach to managing these mooring spaces thank you we've got two questions from mike from the leon store um from the uh, from the the installed branch. Yeah. If the percentage of mooring space being recategorised as pre prepaid moorings is about ten percent, how does this compare with the additional mooring space being provided by new mooring rings? So, I'm just trying to do the rough calculations between imperial and metric, and I may have to resort to my handy friend. But I thought it's about. I think the current uh, visitor moorings is about a kilometre and a kilometre half, something around that limit, if you added it all together. Some of those are as berths, not as linear lengths. So it slightly um, varies because it depends on the size of boats that sit on those berths at, at Paddington. And it's three quarters of a, a mile of additional mooring. So, uh, so let me just somebody help me out in terms of converting that to kilometers on it's not my strong point but bear with me a minute um you're on your own i'm afraid from what <laughs> that's all right i'll uh so what does a trusty friend say so just it's about 1.2 kilometers so actually we'll be creating probably about the same amount of little bit less in terms of additional towpath mooring or space that is moorable because without those moorings it's very difficult to moor at those places although some people do try and put um, pins into hard edges um, it's a just under about 1.2 kilometers of additional uh, moorable space versus probably about one and a quarter one and a half kilometers of the pre-bookable, I think, from my rough calculations. I can look at that in more detail and give you a full answer if you'd like me to, Mike. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a, another comment uh, or question uh, from Dave re regarding these mooring charges. How many mooring charges of £25 were issued in 2021? So how many unauthorised uh, improper mooring charges? I don't have that figure off the top of my head, um, but I can certainly look into how many charges were issued. We certainly do it um, in a couple of places. I think we've done it in London and on the west end of the k &A where we've been actively managing those mooring spaces. But what we found, certainly from where we've applied this process, is it does work as a disincentive. So you don't actually issue many because if people know they're being cited and they know they're likely to get charged, they tend not to do it. Um, it's a bit like you see the traffic warden, you're not gonna take the risk of pulling up for five minutes on a double yellow line. So it does have an impact. So it won't be huge numbers, it'll be in the tens, um, but we have applied it. And in fact, some people do pay it. They don't argue generally. Um, so it does work. Right, thank you. Um, Mike's other question was, will any preference be given during the boating pro booking process for prepaid moorings for visiting boats? And if so, how? Uh, so there isn't a preference given. Um, anybody can book whether you are a, a local boater or visiting from further afield. We do already have a process in place, though, if you're organising a, a, a sort of trip uh, and a number of boats want to come to London, then we can pre-book and set aside times for those boats. So it's more like for organised trips with clubs or cruising clubs or groups of boaters. So that can be done by contacting our customer service. But on the system itself, it is a first come, first serve. But if people know they've got something further ahead, 
then yes we can give priority and we can um, reserve the spaces and block out the booking system for those club events or things that, are, that people are trying to organize. Thank you. Um, we have a question here about the, um, I never know where to pronounce it, SCADA or SCADA data, um, but is the data regarding water levels available to users and where is the nearest location to St Pancras Basin? So that is a question for our, our wonderful water resources colleagues, but I can find that out. I'm sorry, I don't know the precise location, but we I'm have, sure um, there. Sorry, I, I can say we have a whole range right across across the region from our through our reservoirs right through um, through a number of positions, and um, it sends messages and alerts to our on call team throughout the night, um, particularly uh, um, letting showing you know when water levels getting low but yes regarding specific points and the data i don't believe the data is accessible um, to the public it's for internal use, yes. use only yeah only where we have um where we have strong stream and and water level warning systems on on our rivers but we don't have those in the london and southeast region at the moment they are available through our um our, if you go to our website canal river trust org.ua for just stream uh, we do feed that information into those into that warning system but as i say there aren't any in the london southeast region at the moment although um that might change in the future so it, we can certainly get the answer to the question for you but it isn't like a public feed like um the environment agency ones that you can see online thank you uh we have another question from howard is there a danger of creeping metrification for crt as opposed to imperial measure which we're all familiar with why meters not miles particularly with mooring and miles stroke kilometers per hour uh, well we do use both um we publish both in various places so you know our waterway dimensions document carries both metric and imperial so we're not particularly um you know precious about one or the other and they do get both used generally if um you know, I guess it's sometimes it's a generational thing. Um, what you, what comes to your mind first, but we do publish both and use both generally. And if there's any way you would like us to publish some and think in metric or imperial, if you only see one, I'm sure we can oblige. Thank you. At the moment, there aren't any. I've got a question, but there aren't any more. Oh yes, there's one coming up. Um, but before before I go on to that one, um, the impounding station. Uh, I have to say I was incredibly sad to learn that it had been damaged. It's a fascinating building, and I remember going to it for you know many years ago. Um, in fact, soon soon after uh, CNRT took on those docks, um, and uh, before some of the more recent restoration. Uh, where where are we in terms of um, of the actual? You you mentioned that about the pumps, uh, the temporary pumps are doing their job well and what have you were you saying that the temporary pumps are going to be on the go for quite a long time or is the damage such that it may be uh, reasonably easy to sort out soon yeah so the damage that um that we had um if those of you who would have seen the pictures the o2 losing its reef roof basically yes. the impounding station is more or less on the same yes uh, trajectory up, up the docks and basically our roof was also damaged uh the whole roof um we've got video footage was lifting up in the in the wind so quite a, a lot of structural damage so the building is currently um being put up in scaffolding so touch wood um, the temporary pumps will only be with us a while because we think we've got to work around for getting the um, fascinating historic pumps working again and anybody who's um, been able to go one of our heritage open days will know exactly what a fantastic and beautiful sort of operation and building it is so fingers crossed we um, temporary pumps will only be temporary um, but the building itself will have require several weeks if not months worth of work to repair and restore uh, the yeah. room, so it's fully operational but there'll be a top hat over it and internal sort of scaffolding to make sure we can access it safely but uh, do you have, quite do you have any do you have any time scale for for that as i say weeks if not months for the roof roof repairs yeah. but um hopefully we'll be able to get the pumps 
if not yes. by the end of this uh, one, of, one of our, I think one of the people on this call was actually at your office watching the O2 disintegrate. And, yes. Yeah, it uh, was rather, rather dramatic. Rather spectacular. So, um, right, we have another question here from Roger. Can you say what the occupancy rate is for the Paddington pontoon moorings? So I can't give you the the precise figures, but I know it pretty much from May to September, it's almost always full. There's six berths there. At the moment, I've just had a quick look. Um, it's about half occupied this week, so three berths, and that will vary up and down a bit. But as I say, from May onwards, they're pretty much fully booked. Um, so it is quieter in the winter in the winter months. I can certainly get you a sort of breakdown over the last year if that would be interesting for you, Roger. Right. Looks like we've come to the end of them. So I'd just like to, again, thank you both for spending your evening with us um, and sharing all those updates and remind everybody that the mooring consult uh, the consultation finishes to four weeks today. And I know that Ros and um, Matthew will be really pleased to see those 500 responses go up by all the people that were here if they haven't already responded. So thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Ros. And thank you, everybody, for attending and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.